Uh, this is Brian Spears. He's a member of our club, but he's also a very proficient photographer. And someone has had a finger up saying, wait. Uh, Brian Spears has been photographing powwows for a good number of years, and he's very proficient in this. Uh, I'll just let him introduce himself. Okay. So, hi. So, Hamana uh, Neat One, uh, Brian. Or in Serrano, that'd be hello, my name is. So you will be hearing a lot more uh, Native American words coming up right now in the powwow. So this is the photography do's and don'ts in powwows. This one was actually taken this year um, at the University of Redlands at their first powwow since COVID and their fourth powwow ever. Not going. Next slide. Wow. It's just a big button. A big button. Okay. So, and this may be a long uh, lecture type thing, but we, I can condense it and all that. But what we're going to do is basically go over um, what the start is, how they start it, um, photo etiquette, techniques, my equipment, and lighting. Because I know a lot of you are, are going to take photos and how to do it. And there's different techniques in every aspect for every dance. And what is forbidden in to take a photo. So as you can see, what Webster says is not anything I really pertain of, of a powwow. Um, more likely, it is actually um, what we know of is actually a, a gaunton word that has been changed into powwow because we thought it, we didn't know how to say it in English correctly. And it was actually used to be a powwow technically was used to be for in honor of um, a great hunt for food harvesting or worship. And this was for giving thanks, not more of what we see today. What we see today is more of a spiritual and religious idiom and competition. So when you do step foot into the powwow, let's get this one, um, it will be more of everything will be blessed. So when you get into it, the dance arena, which I saw and you saw on the first slide, that is the arena. It, this, the Cal State one will happen at 5 p.m. Well, they will bless the arena. Once they do that, no person other than a dancer or full-blooded native is allowed on the arena floor, unless it is for um, a certain aspect of it. And then everybody is allowed to go in. And that would be usually inner tribals, where anybody who wants to go in can go into the arena. But it is considered sacred and holy area for all natives. Most uh, powwows now around here in the southern region, um, from California all the way to New Mexico, Texas, Utah, are they start with bird singing and gourd dancing. So gourd dancing is the oldest form of or grass dance also of the blessings, and they're starting to get grass dances back because it is a dying dance, and they're trying to get people who know them to start blessing the arena. But you will see at this one, bird dancers from the Serrano Band of Mission Indians area, and they will be doing uh, songs uh, that, are, that are no written, not written, just passed down from generation and generation. You also see women, in, uh, usually uh, younger and older, dancing, like in the bottom slide, and they're just swaying with the music. All, that's all they do. And they're giving honor to the bird dancers. That's it. Um, simple. You are allowed to photograph these events, this part. When grand entry happens, you will be required to stand when you will have the eagle staff. In each one of these photos, you'll see they carry an eagle staff. They also have a color guard. This can happen between 30 minutes all the way up to two or three hours long, depending on how big the powwow is. You are required if you're able to, to stand the whole time. At this point, this is when all the 
dancers are coming in and you will get to see all the dancers that you are going to post possibly take photos of and you can take photos during this time in every way you want it's also a good idea when you're doing this to start looking at who you want to do if they're individual if you want to do portraits or individual photos and i usually write down their numbers so you can see that the guy up here has a number 848 i write them down so i can look for them and i know exactly who i want to photograph and talk to afterwards and then i can get their individual photographs at that time drum circles and you will hear all of it this one uh Cal states is one of the most expensive prizes in it a drum circle is a great way to listen to the music it's also very loud i carry earplugs with me at all powwows you are not allowed to photograph usually during grand entry of a, a drum circle it's very confined they are usually recording so if you want to get photographs you're going to have to use wide angles and go from above all the dancers and the uh, recording people also if they're not singing at that time you can ask permission and they usually will say yes to photograph the drum or any part of it and they don't mind that at all also do not ever touch the drums they're old a lot of them are old and they're they're made out of hide on top your oils can destroy them on your hands so there are certain things you are allowed to photograph and there are certain things you are never allowed to photograph in a powwow and those three there are mainly three things exactly eagle feathers touching and kids and elders although this happens very rarely an eagle feather does happen to fall every once in a while I actually have some new information on that one. So an eagle feather, which often is represented by the Thunderbird, is treated the highest respect by all tribes in every single way. When the eagle feather does fall, when it, it rarely does happen, an elder or a warrior, which is usually a veteran, will guard that feather like, it's, like his life is depending on it. Then they will actually take the whole power will stop. Drums will stop immediately. Everything will stop. And then they will pay their respect. I've been to one of these and it took six hours. And you are standing also when this happens. No photographs are allowed to be taken at this time. It is uh, probably the utmost of the most sacred thing that you can see. Um, I was actually at one point tried to take a photo. And I was escorted and taken off the reservation at this point. And that was at uh, the Thunder and Lightning Powwow. Thunder, Thunder, I will get to that where you will see it. Touching. Yes, the regalia, it is not a costume, it is regalia, and most of it's passed down from generation to generation. You're not allowed to touch it in any way or shape or form. Um, especially certain pieces. Some of them you will see that actually have eagle heads on them. Um, eagle feathers are real. A lot of them are. A lot of the pieces are of natural furs and hides, and that's why they don't touch it. And they're very fragile. So you're not allowed to touch them at all. Kids and elders. Kids, this is, gets to the really interesting thing. Grand entry, you're allowed to take photos of kids and elders. Uh, that's when you want to get them individually. Kids are more likely you'll be able to get them because the parents will be there and you're going to have to ask permission no matter what. Elders, a lot of them, depending on the tribe and how old they are, do not want their photo taken still. They think it takes away from their spirit. They're taking away their soul. And you have to ask them permission. And most likely you will get the answer, no. And you just say thank you for your time and just walk away do not hassle them um it's just part of their it's their culture their religion so as we go as you were saying the regalia there are two parts major parts you will see of the regalia besides the beautiful costumes and 
the men's fancy is a costume. They are the bezel on the right and the roach. The roach is usually made out of porcupine, beaver, or such hairs like that. The bezel, on the other hand, like this one, which is actually from the 1800s, um, that's a real eagle skull and everything. And those are all eagle feathers around it from the same eagle. And this is why you're not allowed to touch it. Um, when this came into the arena and this elder had it, they had actually armed guards around this because of the value of this object. And since then, this has actually now gone to the Smithsonian. They donated it. Um, so as you can see, these are very fragile and they're very unique. And each dancer has unique ones to fit their dance and their culture. So once you get into the dancing, there's the beginning of the competition. You separate it from men and women. There are usually four main dances for all of it. Two men, two women. And that would be the men's fancy, men's southern, women's jingle, and women's fancy. Then you have others. At Sam Manuel, you have a couple's dance. And that one is actually very fun to watch. And if you've seen the posters right now with the two people, those are that's the number one couple how a couple dancing in the country. Um, the men's fancy. This is the most fast paced dance you will see. Very flashy, everything. This is more of a costume, I would say, than a regalia. You will see the bezels on the back and all that, but they're more with bright colors to show people what it is. And the men who dance it are younger. You rarely see a men, older men dancing. They were jumping up and down, moving very fast, spinning their hands. So this is going to be, when you get into photos, this is going to be hoping to get lots of photos very quickly. You do not have time to set it up and all that, just point and shoot, really, on this time. Women's jingle. This is not to be confused with the women's uh, traditional. A woman's jingle started, which I have this, which is really cool, and other notes, uh, usually do not have shawls, and they are always holding their hands on their sides, usually. It started in the area of Wisconsin originally, and then spread to the Sioux Nation during the 1920s. The women's jingle gents then stopped during the uh, 60s for some strange reason that no one really knows. And it was reintroduced in the late 70s now. And it's now become very popular and the most common dance for younger women to do. Then you have mother, men's southern straight. There's different versions of this. And there are quite a few. And you will see different ones. You have the men's southern straight in two different ones. A northern style person on the right and the southern style on their left. Okay. One of them you will see, they will always carry a stick. And they're always also holding mm -hmm. usually a mirror. They're also traditionally also known as like a chicken dance or a grass dance. That's actually a southern straight. Um, then you get the very unique variations of it, depending on where you're from. There is, are usually older men who do it. It's a very less on their bodies and it's a very slow paced dance comparatively and they're always like looking at the ground and giving thanks to the creator women's traditional by far one of my favorites actually you will see the women with shawls this is one the the one that you hear the shawls and beautiful dresses and all that no jingles that's a great way a way to tell the difference this one is a lot more spinning, a lot more dipping, and is to show the fringes moving like the grass. And that's the point of it. It's more like when you see the grass moving in the plains. It's also, you will see the shawls, they're very intricately beaded. And a lot of the times they're passed down from grandmother to mother and child. And sometimes you're seeing a lot more that they're bringing out their own beadwork 
a lot of these women, which is very unique because I've seen some of them that are now getting to the point like they're bringing out like movie characters and like and everything that you'll see it like Spider Man for some of them and all that. I think it's funny, but I don't like them. I don't like it. Then you have other dances. And if you're privileged enough to see it, the most popular is still the hoop dance. This one was taken actually at University of Redlands, their powwow this year. It was a complete surprise. This is the number one hoop dancer in the world. And he was just here on the, just randomly came by and did a performance. So I was, it was just whoever was there, you were privileged enough to see it. It is the most fun to see because you will be able to see the butter, the, a hoop dancer do the butterfly, an eagle, and every aspect of their different animals, the religion. You also will be able to see at times the sun dance, the uh, smoke dance, the white dance, and southern other ones at different powwows around the country. There are certain ones like the Apache that do them in New Mexico, and they do very unique ones that are only available to see in New Mexico. There are also two dances that are forbidden to see show now to photograph. One of them is forbidden to even do anymore. And that is the ghost dance. Um, the ghost dance was done during the time of the Sioux being persecuted and killed during the Trail of Tears, uh, Battle Bighorn Trail of Tears time. It was a, more of an ancestral dance. It is, there are very few people alive that know the dance anymore. And in certain cultures right now with it, it is still partially, if you do it, you are excommunicated from the tribe or are you, and you lose everything. The other one is the Hopi snake dance. They do this still, and there's only been very few instances of everybody, anybody ever photographing it. And the only one that's actually still photographed print available is from Edward Curtis. And he was the first person to ever witness it and photograph it. It is illegal to show, photograph, and it's very rare to ever even see because they do not allow outsiders in to see it. But usually you see a Hopi dancer dressed as a clown, and they will, uh, in black and white, face paint and everything, and they will take a rattlesnake and bite it while live. It's a very interesting ceremony. I've been trying to get to see one myself. So now that we've, this is all just the, before we even get to the photos, all the different dances, all the different technique, all the different aspects of the people who are in it. There are six major things in photo, to photograph a powwow. And they're simple, actually. Eye level, low, wide, details, portrait, and then slow motion. Most of the stuff you would normally do for almost any any. So eye level. As you can see, this one was taken inside. Hard, hard to do when it's inside, because it's a lot more crowded. But this is what you will see a lot more times when you're going to be doing your photos at a powwow. You're going to be standing, you're going to be crouching down, but it's going to be eye level to the dancer, usually. And it's going to be simple. The eye level is what you normally do almost any time when you're photographing. Anyway, just remember your techniques. If it's outside, one over ISO at F16 is great. If you wanted to, I usually go drop down two, one or two steps to bring out more of the color of the regalia. If you don't have, if you don't want to do that, a neutral density filter will great, do great. Low. This is when, this is a little more difficult, especially when they're dancing, but when they're standing, it's a great way to get a sideways portrait or a view that normally people won't see. Um, I usually am crouching and look up or I'm laying on the ground myself completely to do this. You will get more of the time, it's going to be harsh lighting because you're going to be trying to photograph them and it's going to be into the sun. But when you do have that aspect, um, have a reflector um, or have a, a light, which I will go into after, later on how to, when you shoot this style. And you also get a very more unique aspect of the powwow. The wide angle, like we saw in the first, the same slide. It's a great way to show the whole powwow. 
it's not a great way to show detail. But if you want to see the overall beauty of the what it is, it's a great way to show it. And as you can see in this photo also better, that no one, everybody is around the arena. No one, everybody, you don't see anybody inside except if you, the people who are dancing and have the flag and the eagle staff right now. And that's because it was, as I say, it was sacred grounds. And it will be sacred grounds from that point when they bless it till they end the ceremony. Details. This is my favorite aspect, and this is one I usually do more than anything else. Everybody's taking beautiful photos of the regalia and the dancers. I look for something that's unique. The shield that was hand painted, a moccasin that is very worn and the beads are falling off. The details that the what they wear to me are more important than what the whole dance is. Because it shows the history and the uniqueness of that dancer and their culture and the history of that family. Like this uh, this piece right here, the shield, happens to be from the Sioux of the buffalo hunt. This was actually probably the 1980s when that one was done, but it does show, look like it's older. Portraits. This is when you have the chance to be one-on-one, -on -one, really. And this will be a good aspect. This one was done with a neutral density filter at uh, University of Arizona. And you will have sometimes to do a photo, 30 seconds to two minutes. That's it. Make sure you, I will say, don't shoot raw. When you're shooting this at powwows, raw is great for shooting everything. But when you're shooting this many photos, and I will shoot probably at this powwow between 3,000 to 8,000 photos a day. I will be shooting all in JPEG, the largest form of JPEG, because I do not have the space for all the memory cards and to upload them that long. That's going to take me about a month or two to upload them. Also, I have to re give them back to the dancers. Some of the times when I do the back photos, and I do portraits like these. I will don't. I will say in on, if they would like a copy of their photo, and I will send them copies, no matter what, printed or digital, of every photo I take, and they can use them however they want. I own the copyright, but they can use them for their own publicity for anything like that, and I always include my watermark on it, so they really can't get rid of that. These were done at University of Redlands. The, one on, the woman is actually was just crowned uh, Miss Powell Princess for UCR for this year. These were done, the two on the left, the men and the woman are at Cal State. The one on the left is actually Sue, Ogala Sue, very unique headdress. Those are all eagle feathers. It took me three years to get that photo. And the reason why is he would not let me take his photo unless I asked for it in Sioux. And sometimes it will take that long. I've, I'm waiting hopefully this year to get one. And it's taken me six to eight years to get a photo of the person. But I have to learn their language or get their respect in order to get those photos. So it's not just, oh, can I get your photo? They want me to show them respect. And that's why it takes so long to get some of these. The one in the center is Nora Pusselton. She is Dane or Navajo, full-blooded. She also works at University of Redlands. She's the one who helped start the powwows back up at the University of Redlands. She used to be a fancy dancer, and she still is every once in a while, but all that is her own beadwork. On the back of it of her dress is a hummingbird. Beautiful. The one on the right here is at the Thunder and Lightning powwow at Morongo. And that's the only way, the best way to get photos is not inside that tent that they do. It's outside. Are there, and you have the background, beautiful background, minus the tents. And that's something you will have to learn, that you, no matter what, you will have crappy backgrounds. 
in these photos, no matter what, unless you have, if you're allowed to bring out a studio style setup, which you're not allowed to. I've been trying to for years. And I made. Yeah. And that's something. You can get the low and that you're still not going to get that full, like that one right there was on the ground. I was kneeling to do that. And that one, it just came out better than the other ones, but it's still the bad background. Um, it's still a beautiful photo. Yeah, you can Photoshop, get rid of it all. Especially with the new AI techniques, you can get rid of it all. You can have them standing on Mars now. But it is still the culture. And even though it has a bad background, I still like it because it shows that they are still dancers. They're still part of this culture. It is still a religious event and competition. And it's still part of what we're seeing today that's not dying out. The people who are selling the regalia, the, the artifacts, or souvenirs, not artifacts, the food. Slow shutter, probably one of the hardest ones to do, especially when you're doing a lot of the path of it. The two that you're gonna be able to probably do this really easily are women's fancy, like this one, and men's fancy, because they're so fast. So if you do it, you can actually do the longer shutter speed and not worry about that. This one was done inside, not outside. I have some outside and it's just as hard because it's just a hit or miss. And it's not worth it. When I'm doing photos like this at a powwow, doing slow shutter, it's not worth it, honestly. Unless you are having them individually and you can have them dance for yourself by your, themselves and then you can plan it, it's not. This is one of my favorite ways to do it also, candids. The photo on the right, the mother helping the, her daughter get ready for the dance or the, the one in the center, which I thought was the epitome of perfection at that point. The girl who is a jingle dancer taking a photo on her iPad of her brother doing a men's fancy. Just randomly getting those photos, it shows a lot more to uh, the culture, the history, the family unity of the people because you see it and it's more, everything is community. If one person falls, they, another person helps them up. If someone needs something, they always help each other. And that's just like this, no matter what. If you need more feathers, if you need water, no matter what, they're always, each person there is helping each other. There's also other aspects of powwows. Some of them you won't always see Native Americans from North America. America, per se. You will see Aztec dancers now at some of them. And you will now see Hawaiian at Hula. And they're getting that change because they are all the first people. It's not Native American. It's now called first people. So you're now seeing the first peoples of America dancing. And you're now going to see a lot more Aztec, Toltec, Mayan style dancing and more Hula coming out probably within the next three to five years that our people are now getting to the powwows more. There are traditional ones like Cal State, Thunder the Mount Morongo, Gathering the Nations, which is the largest one, that will not do that. But the smaller ones are starting to do that, small mom pop style. There's one up in the high desert that just had hula. And if you want to know which ones will have it, powwows.com will tell you all the current powwows are around. So lighting. This is going to be the bigger technique when you're at a powwow. How to light your subject. Um, as I say, this sunny rule is sunny. The sunny 16 rule is great to start. I carry, I do not use a flash. For one simple reason, it blinds their eyes, especially when they're dancing in the sun and they're trying to go back and forth from dances. I have an onboard camp light, the GoPro light that you can get for $40. It's a small LED rechargeable. I use that. 
I also am bringing out a LumaCube uh, panels this year, which I have one here, and you can adjust the Kelvin balance on it. So it's bright or non, almost non-existent, and you can change even the brightness of that Kelvin. So I will have, so we can do tilt it up or down on it with the barn doors. I also have reflectors with me. Another thing is coming up is people are talking about the use of lens hoods. Big thing article coming out right now, going to be on Adorama and BNH and in some of the photo magazine. Are they worth it? Yes, they are, especially at a powwow. Because sporting events, powwows, if you're at, when I'm photographing, I'm usually near the arena or sometimes in the arena because I've been given permission. I've been, I've had people fall on me. I've gone through about 30, 40 lens hoods. I'd rather go through a lens hood than a camera lens. And I have a new one with me and I will show everybody my setup. That's my gear that I'll carry. That's about a hundred pounds, 80 to hundred pounds. So that's my equipment. I will carry guaranteed two bodies, maybe three. Uh, my normal ones, the D10 or the D4S, are my two main ones. I will carry probably my 5D just for fun. 20D because I love the white balance on that. Still the best one Canon ever did. Um, my go-to lens will always be the 24 to 105. It's a simple lens. The F4 is perfect. You can get the close-up. You can get the detail. You can get the wide angle from it. You really don't need many other lenses. Of course, I have a 105 macro, and that's for when I do the portraits by themselves, and I want to do headshots. Also, if they're doing fast dances, like the Men's Fancy, I'm going to use that because it's the fastest lens I have, minus the 50 millimeter. I also will have my, my large lens, so I'm, depending on how far I am, I'm going to want to get very close to some of the subjects, and I don't want to be that close to them at all, because I want that shallow depth of field. I'm going to use that 400 millimeter or 80 to 200. Um, my GoPro lights, I always carry a point and shoot. I know it sounds silly, but my Canon G11 or just a regular point and shoot camera, sometimes it's great to have just in case I just want to see a really quick photo. I don't want to set it up. I can just take a point, click, I'm done. Just like your cell phone. But my G11, I love that the, the back can change the uh, screen. I can change how I'm looking at things. So if I'm trying to do the photos of the drum circles, I can go up and I can look down quicker instead of trying to get a, my big camera, adjust it, it's easier that way. I will bring a film camera most of the time, depending on what day I go. This year I'm probably gonna bring, and it's usually a medium format. So that is a big thing that people don't realize. It's going to be a lot longer to take a photo. When I'm doing some of the portraits, I will use film. It's fun. I don't advise it. The camera alone's about, the camera by itself is about 40 pounds. And you have to have a tripod. And that's another thing. You're not allowed to use tripods, selfie sticks or anything like that at a powwow. Lighting, as I said, the LumaCube, which I will show, um, and my GoPro. I'm very organized with my, my, my photos. In Lightroom, I have everyone categorized by year and then by powwow. On this, this is called Trulo. It's a free website and app. I did the same thing, basically, what I did in Lightroom, and I have labels for everything. So I know exactly which powwows I used for black and white film, color film, if I shot for a newspaper or a magazine, if it was for publishing, everything like that, if I got model release forms. So I know exactly which ones they are. I also have it broken down to every dance that they've done. Every tribe in North America is separated on that from, so I can figure out which ones I need, which ones I'm looking for. And that's basically it. The biggest thing I will tell you beyond anything on a powwow is model release form. And I'm gonna go get mine. Model by girl. 
You can use a monopod. I don't use it. It's too complicated, honestly, when you're using it because you're trying to set it up and hold it and everything. It's not worth it. This is this is my model release form. So I have it through a website called, an app called Easy Release. It's available on Mac, iOS, and Android. It's about 20 bucks. It saves a lot of money in the long term. It is also very complicated to do anything. You can click it. <laughs> I have a, for a model, or is it? It will tell me the name of the person, my name, the location, which since I'm using my iPad is, or your phone, when you use it, it will have a geolocation on it. It'll also give you the date, which is great. You will also require me to put the name, the address, the e contact for the model, so you can email them a copy or mail them a copy, and they will require it. Also, it tells you gender, ethnicity. Then it will require you on this app to take a photo of that model to show that you are actually taking a photo of that model. Then once you do that, it will go on further. If it's an under the person's under 18, they are required to have their parent or guardian sign it. It takes about five minutes to sign this form. Also, it will save you thousands of dollars if you get sued. Or you take a photo like these. A lot of my photos are copyrighted. If I don't want to send them money for showing it in a public space. And some of them I have spent, given the money to, to do that. Or I put them in competition and I gave them money if I won for royalties. So it's just one aspect of it. But if you they go up to a, in specifically elders and you ask them to do a photo by themselves, they'll usually, as I say, they'll usually say no. Tell them that you have a model release form. They will probably say yes. And they're more reluctant to people that don't have one because they don't want that photograph all over the place. But if you have one, it's a legal liability for you and them, which covers so many bases that you will need. What if you were taking a photo of the wrong camera? You don't need it. I only use this when I'm doing one-on-one, -on -one. one on one, or I'm trying to get a photo of a child. I just don't want, because especially with kids right now and all the problems everybody's had, it's better to be safe than sorry. And plus, you're on private property. So technically, since you're on private property, you do need to have a, you should have a model release form. If you're on public property, like in the middle of the street, you really don't need it because it is public, you're paying taxes on it. Although Cal State, you're paying taxes, but don't on time. Still private property. So yes, any other questions? We have questions from uh, I have the people on Zoom. I have a few questions. We'll give an opportunity for those on Zoom to. Uh... Does anybody on Zoom have uh, any questions? You should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, I have. Do you have anybody with any questions, Mike? Okay. Bring it on. Well, I have a couple of questions. Bring it on. Uh, you, you said you were going to show your, your camera equipment. Yes. What, what camera do you, because you mentioned you shoot in JPEG. Yes. Okay. I will also use XQD cards. So, so my, my question to you is, which, which cameras are you using? You know, what, what, what's the megapixel size on the camera? Uh, the D4S, I think is 20 something. The D810 is, uh, I think, 34. You don't really need that many megapixel. You're not going to be shooting that. Yeah. 
No, I actually do not know the megapixels by heart. It, uh, it's been about 20 megapixels. Yeah, 20 to 30. That's what all. What body do you have there? This is the D4S. This is the camera that Nikon brought out, and it was the first SLR that they brought out for the International Space Station. So they brought it out okay. for people to use. This was the predecessor to the 850. And this is the 810. Lighter weight. I have the about the extra battery pack on the bottom. That's quick and easy. G11's at home. Of course, GoPro, if I want to shoot video. Because it takes up too much memory and battery life on your cameras. This is the Nikon uh, 80 to 400. Uh, the one from Canon, the 28 to 300, is a phenomenal lens. At 3.5 to 5.6 uh, f-stops, minimum focal length is three and a half feet. And that's the reason I would use my 5D. It's a mainly a wildlife photography lens, but it's a phenomenal one when you're doing powwows. Of course, the 105 macro, which is the top macro lens right now in the world, the 24 to 70 and a 50 millimeter. Is it? Always a 50. I have like 16 of these. And I'm not kidding. Different versions of it from the 1960s to now. Yeah. Another thing I used, instead of having neutral density and circular polarizer, these are a unique aspect. These are a revolving ring. And also, if you're doing the lunar eclipse or solar eclipse, these are great to have. They go up to F, uh, 1,000 stop. It's a variable density and a neutral density. A circular polarizer, neutral density filter in one. And you change the duct. And these are adjustable rings. So this one's for 67 millimeter to 82 millimeter. And you can screw into any size. They are big. Uh, it's not, I'm not that good looking. So these are them. And you just change, there's two little rhinestones up here and you can change the color on it. These are the greatest things. And you can, this is H and Y. I've waited a year to get this one because they are sometimes so hard to get. So the inside right here, you can you screw in. No, it's a screw in filter. And this is what I will have on my lens the whole time because it's better to have, I'd rather lose it for, this is $500, might as well keep it on. And especially in the daylight, neutral density of circular polarizer, a lot of times you're gonna see the jingles and they're gonna have a reflection on them. And sometimes when you see the mirrors for the people, the men having the mirrors, it's gonna have a reflection on it. So it's good to have. And I have the one for the 67 and this one goes from 49 to 62. And then I have my iPad for the real. I will show you when afterwards. I'll show you how this works. And this is the Luma Cube. This is the studio size. So I will put it on my, I will carry it with me actually. I will have the tripod with me. So you can adjust it. This is really fun. So you can adjust the Keldon and whatever you want. And you, no, no, you do not. It fits any tripod size on the bottom, as long as you have a regular tripod screw. Um, I'm going to carry this by hand, and I'll probably have a tri the tripod on me instead. Now, if I'm going to do a, an individual photo, I will have this set up somewhere else where the Sam Manuel will know. And before they, I, they don't allow the backgrounds, so I'm going to have this set up. I will talk to the photographer beforehand and let them know. They usually know me, so I will have that set up beforehand to have it ready for me if I want to. 
of course, have all your batteries charged, extra memory cards. Any other questions? Yeah, I do. Yeah. You know, I a lot of people today, you mentioned you do your GoPro. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you ever use your iPhone for any photography out there? No, I do not. I, if I use it, it's only for release forms. Do people use oh. out there yes. Oh my God, yes. No. I have all, a lot of people use their phones and they don't have equipment and they're just there for the day with their family and they're trying to get selfies with the powwow dancers. Hey, can we get a quick photo and all that? That's okay. Um, a lot of times you also see, not to be a stereotypical, but Asian photographers there. And they will not listen to anybody. They will go in the arena. They will get in the way of dancers. They will get in the way of you. And they will also yell at you. And I have that happen to me almost every powwow. And I will carry my, my press release form badge at all times. So they know, yeah, I'm an official photographer no matter what. So, And I always carry business cards. Something that you should always have if you have any. If you don't go to Staples, get some, make some print one out. A couple dozen, they're taking photos, so they have no matter what. If you lose, if they lose the model release form or something like that, they can always contact you. No, no, I've seen one of them that they knocked them down. And one point, I've seen one person took the camera and threw it. Sometimes it's fun to watch, honestly. Well, why don't we go back to the question of the other? Yeah. So some of these are very old, is what you're saying. Yes. But do any of the Indians go through and remake their the regalia? They will actually repeat some of it. But a lot of times they don't. They, they rather, rather try to get you in. Um, sorry. They, they will, will actually rather get, get new ones and put um in retired old. Because it's more important for them to keep it in the family than it is to repair it. Yes and no. Yes. We have a question from Sam. Muted. Now I'm mute. Not anymore. Now, okay. 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 Now I just want to know. So you put the release release form on your iPad and you have them sign it on that? Yes. Okay. I also have it on my cell phone, both of my cell phones. Oh, oh, that's a good I idea. I carry it on me at all times, no matter what. I don't carry my iPad. The battery is crap. Mm. So I always carry it on me at all times. And it's just safe if I'm doing a photo anywhere. I'm doing a model or I see someone I like on the side of the street. I'll have them sign it no matter what. Okay, so you say that Gro uh, GoPro Light. Where do you buy yes. those? I got mine at Best Buy. It's like this little thing right here. Mm. A little clicker on it. Very bright. Has three settings. Mm. And then it has a flashing one. Oh, and, and that takes the place of a flash? Yeah. A large flash? Yeah. Anyway, of course, it, it's attached to your or, uh, the shoe, the, that yes. light. That's a cold shoe mount. It's all plastic. Oh, mm. that's bright. Yeah. I actually need to charge it. So I'll go okay, right so the coat, shoot on the cold shoe. Mm -hmm. It stands right there. Oh, Doesn't so you, you use it because it doesn't have as bright a flash? No, because a lot of the times the uh, the when you're taking a flash, they are using it. They don't know when it's going to come and all that. And also sometimes when it's bright, I'm using this for back. I'm using it for backlighting. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it the uh -huh. Out the sun on the back behind them, and this will compensate for that. Also, I uh, also have, of course, I'll show you. Yes, a lot of equipment. Reflector, of course. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing the low lighting or anything like that, a portrait, I will have a reflector. Mm -hmm. Simple, small, mm -hmm. gold, and white. And mm -hmm. I'll use that with the GoPro on there. And I'll use like the gold and I'll adjust it to get their face or some part of their regalia. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. A simple, lightweight. 
Yeah. Forty bucks. Yeah. Yes, it is. I got my. I got this in Santa Barbara three years ago. This new one. Yeah. And that Loom Cube, the Loom Cube. Uh, do you put that on? You said a separate, like a monopod or a tripod. A tripod. A tripod. It's going to be on a tripod. I got this studio kit. It was two hundred and fifty bucks. Mm -hmm. Two, a whole case, two lights, chargers, and the tripods. Everything hmm. available on Amazon. Luma Cube is now bought out. Amazon bought Luma Cube out last month. Hmm. Um, so everything's bought on through B and H, Adorama, or Amazon. Amazon, twenty four hour. You have Prime, forty eight hour. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted it, you can get it within before the powwow. And so the Luma Cube, how does that help with portraits? Because it's just a uh, just a regular lighting, like studio lighting. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, make sure that everything's evenly lighted. Oh, is it LED? Like yes, LED? it is all LED. I will not shoot anything without LED now. So with a small light, what they're actually doing, rather than having something that flashes on, mm -hmm. that they don't know when it's coming, what you're saying is you just put it on so they can see it to begin with. Yep. They don't have to flash. Yes. So I do not, since instead of having the flash, I use that to keep on the whole time. And since it's rechargeable, I don't have to worry about buying so many batteries, which I love. My new lens hood. It's a unique one. Fits any size. Love this thing. Got it on Kickstarter. And it's flat, lightweight, silicon. And if it's really hot, I will put it on so I don't damage my lens. Also, protect it. Any, Any other questions? questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, Nick Kohler asks Are gratuities expected or accepted? Okay. okay. This, this gets to a very a unique question. Gratuities are not. There is an actual dance called the blank. <laughs> blanket dance. Okay. And that is a unique one. Usually, when someone has died or something like that, or like the hoop dancer who came in to offset some of his expenses. They'll put a blanket out while he is dancing. You can go up and put money into it. No change. They do not allow change, only bills. So, that is one way. Um, if you do want to give compensation, talk to them privately. Most of the time, they'll, I can guarantee they won't say no. Everybody wants money, especially in this economy right now. Any other questions? Yes, there are monetary prizes, especially at Cal, this Cal State one. It is, I think the prize right now for the drum circle is 280,000 for the top drummer circle. It is the most expensive and valuable, one of the top five in the country. Um, the total purse, I think this year right now is $6.8 million for total uh, prizes. And they're paying down, every drum circle will be getting money and they're paying down, I think, to the fifth position in dances. Like yes, yeah, so, and they are some of these are professionals. These are what they do for their living, and that's why I have the uh, form because some of these do require you to do. Yeah, and as I saw some people on Facebook, they were uh, talking uh, about people not allowed to take photos. A lot of things have changed within the last five, ten years about photography in powwows. Um, a lot of times they weren't allowing pow uh, photos, and a lot of powwows, certain ones, still do not allow you to do photos. Um, as I say, it's everything is up to the MC and the arena director, what they say. That is the big thing that you have to listen to. You will hear them the whole time, cracking jokes, giving uh, nicknames to everybody, um, and everything, but they will say when the photos are not allowed, inner tribals, which is 
to dance before a competition. So that's basically to get everybody acclimated to the dance, the drums and everything. Yes. Nope. It's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask permission on those. And I've done some of them and I've said, can I get your name and all that? And I just delete them afterwards. It's sad, but I rather respect their wishes than get in trouble. So you take the picture and go and ask. Yes. That's all, it's always ask for per forgiveness than permission. Brian, uh, for those who are interested in meeting at Cal State, yes. where, what time and where? Okay, so the actual schedule has not been posted. Friday night, they are blessing the arena at 5 p.m. It's a very unique ceremony if you would like to go. This is just for the field trip part. Yeah, okay. This is, okay, the whole thing. Yeah, I'll give it everything. Okay, everything. the field trip. Okay, the field trip. Um, grand entry is at uh, 1 p.m. Bird singing starts at noon. So between uh, the official thing starts at 11. So be, I'm going to be there about noon. So I'm going to be at the in front entrance of Cal State for the um, where we walk in. And last year they had a big sign that says "Welcome to the powwow," and that's where I'll be. I will be wearing a bright red or orange shirt. On the website. Yes, my phone number and my email are on the website. I will have my phone on me. You will see me. I will have the big backpack. And carry water. Carry a water bottle. One of the big things, carry your own water bottle. You're not going to be able to get water much at the power unless you go to as Cal State. You can go to the fountains to fill up. But just carry your own water bottle. You will need it. And if you have a chance, earplugs. They will be really good for you. Hearing the same style song over and over again, when you're that close, your ears will be ringing. <laughs> 